So good morning, everyone. How are you today? Can you hear me? Yes, no? Okay, very good. All right, awesome. So I want to thank you all. So first and foremost, thank you everyone for showing up today. Um, as we know, or as many of you all know, on um, the last Friday of every month, Healthy Human Services ho hosts our um, Equity Matters um, webinar. And the purpose of our Equity Matters webinar is to spotlight um, how equity is being performed within New Hanover County. Um, internally, in terms of Healthy Human Services, and also externally with our community partners. Um, this month, it is Pride Month, and we wanted to take the opportunity to have conversations with our friends and families and our allies that are LGBT. Um, and so we wanted to be invited to our table. We have Brooke Lambert. Um, she is the director for the Mo Mohin, or is it Mohin? Schultz um, LGBTQIA Resource Center at UNCW. Um, and correct me, did I say that right, Brooke? Yeah, it, it's Mohan Schultz. Okay, Mohan Schultz. Thank you so much. Then we have Cooper Mertens. Um, Cooper is um, the Data and Impact Coordinator for LINK. And we also have Kara Schaefer, and she is with New Hanover County Health and Human Services, Child Protective Services Social Worker. So I welcome you all to our table today. Um, I appreciate you for participating in our panel, and we're going to lead right out. We're going to start with introductions. So to my right, <laughs> it might be your left, um, Cooper, um, thank you for coming. Um, would you like to share about who you are and what you do? Yeah, of course. Um, so hi, everyone. I'm Cooper. Um, you can also call me Coop. Um, I am Link's Data and Impact Coordinator. I am also a human rights advocate and the co-author to Link's Eyes on the Law initiative um, and a proud member of the LGBTQIA community. I appreciate you. Thank you so much. And could you explain or could you share with us your pronouns? Yes, my pronouns are they, them, and theirs. So I, I identify as non-binary, yes. Thank you so much. Um, under Cooper on my screen is going to be Brooke Lambert. Um, Brooke, could you share with us um, who you are and your pronouns? Absolutely, my name is Brooke Lambert. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. And I'm the director of the Moen Schultz LGBTQA Resource Center at UNCW. Um, so for us on campus, there are two full-time staff members, myself, as well as um, our program specialist, Asher, and we provide um, support services for uh, students, faculty, staff, as well as some community resources as well. Thank you very much. Um, then we move over to Kara Schaefer. Kara, could you share who you are and your pronouns? Yes, my name is Kara Schaefer. Uh, my pronouns are they, them, theirs, and um, I'm a child protective uh, services social worker, and I've been here for about a for a year in June. So, and your pronouns? They, them, theirs. Thank you very much. And last but not least is me. <laughs> your trusty host for the day. Um, I am Fawn Rhodes. I'm the New Hanover County Health and Human Services Equity Coordinator. Um, I've been with New Hanover County um, for going on a year and a half. Um, and so I love what I do. Equity is my jam. Um, I live, breathe, and sleep equity. It means so much to me to be able to work in human services and provide and look at things from a people-centered perspective and not just a population-centered. Um, people-centered, I find, um, gives more direct impact um, and it really is able to show the compassion and grace that that we need and getting people services and assistance that they need and my pronouns are she her and hers so these are our this is our trusty panel for today I appreciate you all we're going to start right into it in terms of our conversation um Brooke um what do people need to know about your organization and the services that they provide at, provide at UNCW Sure. Um, so all of our programs that we run, uh, we run off of four pillars, um, support, educate, advocate, and celebrate. So all of the programs that we offer fall under one or multiple of those pillars. Um, this year we did, we had over 200 programs that we ran out of our center throughout both semesters. Um, so we have a wide range of programming opportunities for students, faculty, staff. 
And I think something that some folks may not know is most of our events are also open to the community as well. As we're an open campus, we are a state um, in the state system, so we're a state school. Um, so our programs, while they're geared towards our um, student population or our faculty and staff population, um, community is welcome at a lot of those events as well. And really the best way to kind of find out what we're doing um, is to follow us on social media. Um, specifically Instagram is probably where you're gonna find the most up-to-date information. Um, as things change, um, that's the easiest way for us to keep in contact. And so um, we would love to have folks come out. We offer different types of educational opportunities, whether that's through us going out and doing workshops um, or bringing other folks to campus um, to, to share with us, uh, you know, about what they're doing. Um, a lot of, again, a lot of those are open to community as well. So when you say some of the, give us an example of some of the example um, of some of the events that you all have had um, that are available for not just the UNCW students, but also just the community at large. Sure. So um, one thing we get asked a lot is about workshops and trainings. Um, and so we have our Safe Zone series, which our Safe Zone series consists of four different workshops. We have LGBTQA 101, Understanding Gender, Active Ally, and then Using Our History to Heal. Those are all offered each semester. Um, and those workshops are open to the community. So if it works for it, granted, they're typically, you know, some Monday through Friday, you know, during the workday. So that may not work for some folks. And you, we don't offer currently a virtual option as well. So you do have to be on campus. Um, but those workshops are all open to, to the community. We've also had have had different um, artists come in, whether those are authors um, or um, different types of artists coming in and, and running workshops or um, having different lecture series, all of those things are also open to the community. Um, and so unless something specifically says for students only or your one card will be needed, um, a lot of what we do is, is open and available for community members. I appreciate you um, sharing and expanding more on that. We're going to hop right into Cooper. Cooper, tell us about your organization and some of the services that you all offer, specifically that are um, focused for our LGBT community. <clears throat> um, so Link has a mission of turning setbacks into comebacks for all people returning from incarceration, as well mm -hmm. as educating and motivating all youth to make positive life choices. And I just wanna make sure that there's a little note about that we're very inclusive. Mm -hmm. um, we want to make sure that we're serving all communities from all walks of life. Um, and that is regardless of gender identity or mm -hmm. LGBTQ um, identification. Um, Link has several reentry programs for people returning from incarceration, all with an aim of really providing comprehensive and well-rounded services. So we have our MER residential camp, Uh oh. This, um, which offers transitional our PH2 program, which is an education and employment opportunity program. We have NC Fit, which is a medical and mental health network, um, a local reentry council, which serves as a network of agencies providing basic needs, um, housing stipends and transportation, along with many other support supportive services um, to individuals who have a history of incarceration. Um, we have our healthy opportunities pilot. Um, we were one of the organizations um, granted that opportunity, and um, so that's with an aim of supporting individuals and families with Medicaid with well-rounded and comprehensive services, um, not just medicalized services. Mm -hmm. um, we also have a permanent supportive housing program and more. We have a lot under the link umbrella. Um, we also partner with Port City United. Um, and have three CRCs placed in schools around the community to connect with kids who are considered tier three or at risk. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and then we also house an urban farm on our residential campus mm -hmm. to allow residents the opportunity um, to work on the farm, produce their own food, provide food for the community and really learn those skills. Um, and then also while providing all of these services, Link also has an aim of educating the community through Eyes on the Law advocacy. As I mentioned earlier, I am the co-author of that initiative um, and runs the Link Anatomy program as well to connect individuals to provide scholarship for peer support specialists or community health worker trainings. Um, 
And within all of this, we do take an aim and make an effort to really serve any minority communities. And that is very inclusive of LGBTQ individuals, especially because we're well aware of the high amounts of LGBTQ involvement in the criminal justice system, especially since LGBTQ individuals are two times more likely to be arrested um, than um, other individuals. And um, so we just, we make, we're mindful about applying for funding opportunities to really make sure that we're being inclusive and casting out our net to anyone um, that may need services from us. So out of everything that you said, I want to start, I'm going to take us all the way back to our first step. Yes. How about we tell people, what is LINK? Like you all offer so many services um, for those who are formerly justice involved, right? So, but just in general, when um, here in New Hanover County, I know people know who LINK is. Well, most people know who LINK is. Let me rephrase that. Um, and I also would dare say Southeastern North Carolina, many people know who what LINK is. But for those who are not familiar with LINK um, and, and they're not um, in New Hanover County or in the Southeastern area, who is LINK? And, you know, and why is it so important um, to our human services populations? So LINK is a massive nonprofit organization and a reentry program um, primarily. Um, and as you said, we offer many services to individuals returning from incarceration. Um, and we also connect with youth. Um, and really our aim and why it's so important to have reentry services in our community and in this sector um, is because there are, I mean, you know, there are thousands, we have the largest mass incarceration system in the entire United States, uh, well, in, in the entire world in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, and so a lot of the times I think people, you know, there's this ideology that still exists of like, put them away and lock away the key and throw away the key, you know, but what people don't understand is that thousands upon thousands of those individuals are returning to our community every year. And oftentimes they're lacking resources, they're placed with stigma, they're placed with labels that are unhelpful that, mm -hmm. you know, block them from having resources um, that other individuals might have access to. Um, and so it's really making sure that all individuals from all walks of life have access to health and equity and all of these different resources that we offer. And I would agree with you. Also, just um, taking it a little bit more um, focused in, in terms of link, um, we also realize, I don't have the actual numbers in front of me, so um, I do apologize if I don't, but when we talk about our Black American community and our Hispanic American community, there's a higher um, number of individuals that have been incarcerated or formerly justice involved throughout um, the lifespan of, of the history of the United States, um, which come back into our community and the services traditionally or historically that they have had accessibility to has been little to no, none. And so Link has actually stood in the gap in that space for many of our historically marginalized populations to be able to gain access to services that they otherwise would not have had access to. Um, and so when we talk about historically marginalized populations, it is inclusive of race, and um, but it's also those who have additional labels um, attached to that. Am I correct? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. We actually make an effort to serve and make sure that we're providing resources to individuals who have multiple labels stacked against kind of stacked against them mm -hmm. um, within this community and so it's very important that we are bridging that gap specifically for minority communities yeah i definitely agree with you car tell us about your organization and um, what about some of the services that your department within our hss does so <clears throat> excuse me um, I'm with so, so I'm with Child Protective Services. So we investigate or assess for like reports of child neglect or abuse, mm -hmm. um, and so we offer we assess but provide resources, referrals, all those types of things. And one thing I was thinking about is we don't have a set picture of what families look like. Families define their own their own self and who is in their families. Mm -hmm. So with Child Protective Services, we aren't going in with anything. Like we 
they define who they are and we're going to assess and refer and provide resources regardless of what that family looks like. Um, we, and I'm seeing more in terms of like LGBT um, mm -hmm. populations, you know, and so we're constantly having conversations about how we can best serve these families and assess for the safety of these children mm -hmm. and get these parents resources. And then also, you know, going through trainings um, and we have a whole, you know, child welfare, like practice guideline on working with these communities. But mm -hmm. the main goal is always like assessing for safety and providing resources and just making sure that these parents and the children know their resources and have that get access to them. So, but the main thing that we do is the assessing for safety. So expand on that. So let's talk about that. Why is that important? Why is it important that when we go into our community and we are dealing with our vulnerable populations, specifically in a high trauma um, time, um, that we go in with the lens of looking at how families allow themselves to define each other and not looking at traditional um, family structures? Yeah, because every, I mean, every family is different. And so every family is going to need different resources. If there's a child that we're working with that is LGBT and that's causing, you know, the child turmoil or the parents turmoil, then we've got to go into that with a lens of what can we do for this specific family? Mm -hmm. Or if there's a, like a single, like a single father mm -hmm. that we're working with, you know, we got to go into a perspective of how can we get this person resources? So, I mean, it's, it's so important to not go in and be like, I'm going to do this this way, because this is what I've done with this, like you said, more traditional, like our stereotypical traditional families, mm -hmm. um, because then we're not providing the most accurate or, you know, resources to families. And you know, we want to see success and we want parents to be successful. So, definitely always go in with an open, ready to have an open dialogue and be like, what do you need specifically? And that comes with knowing what our resources are for all of these different families and being able to provide those. Does that make yeah, sense? Yeah, I agree with you with that. And also not going in with our own perception of specific labels. Um, yeah. So if you go in and you might see two men in a household or you see two women in a household and you just automatically want to lead out mm -hmm. assuming that maybe that's a sister or assuming that yeah. that maybe is, you know, a friend in the household or what have you not taking the time to have a conversation and asking, you know, um, could you share with me the connection between you and the right. child? So you can understand and you can be able to cater those services to what, add to your point, to what that child needs and not just being assumptive about who that other additional person, because tra stereotype, stereotypical tradition says that it should be a man and woman or um, inside of a household. But when we go in, you can see a variety, you know, you can see right. grandparents, you can see yeah. aunts and uncles, you can see different guardians, you can see different people who are there to support that child, but it doesn't look like your particular frame. Am, am I correct? Right. Yeah, exactly. So when we, as we are going a little deeper, there was something that um, Brooke said a little earlier that um, that I really want to expand on earlier. And anybody can talk about this or we all can talk about this is why is it um, important to understand gender? Um, in today's, in 2023, um, when we are with so many things, sometimes I feel like the further we go in technology, the further we go back in terms of moral and the ethics as far as life is concerned. Um, why is it important that we have these real conversations about understanding gender? Nobody wants to talk. <laughs> I can start us off. Um, I think that, uh, I mean, first of all, it's it's allowing folks to be able to articulate um, their own experiences, right? And I think that something that's I that I think that I find interesting is that everybody is, you know, when we're hearing this narrative around gender, it's like, well, where is all of this coming from? And this is all so new. And what's I find interesting is that it's actually not new um, and that historically um, a lot of indigenous communities had words and, and language for multiple genders and multiple sexualities. And so it was um, really kind of colonization that removed a lot of that piece. 
Um, and one thing that we really like to talk a lot about is that our, our language evolves, right? And it evolves at a community level, um, meaning that as we, you know, kind of continue to have these conversations, we are allowing ourselves the space to be able to um, have more conversations and have more language around what people's experiences are. And so these are not new experiences that people experience gender differently. Um, it's just that we are now talking about it and we have the language to be able to share that and to articulate that and to help people be able to, um, you know, better relate to other folks in the community or better share their experiences. And so I think one important piece that I like to get out there about gender is that, you know, yes, you know, this does seem to be a hot topic at the moment, but these are not new conversations. And I would especially say with folks within our LGBTQA communities, you know, again, these are not new conversations. It's just that now we have the language as well as the ability to share this information more broadly, more widely. We've got social media, we have internet, we have all these different ways of communicating with each other. And so, you know, if you look at things 10 or 20 years ago, we just didn't have the ability to talk to somebody across the world or across the country and realize that we're all having very similar experiences. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Um, Cooper, what are your thoughts on that? <clears throat> um, I was just, I mean, I absolutely echo everything that Brooke just said. Um, and I just, I think it's so important within the conversation of gender to acknowledge that it is a social construct um, that like so many of the other labels that I mean specifically the individuals that Link works with are placed with um, and kind of burdened with um, that are given to them by society you know gender can feel the same way mm -hmm. for a lot of individuals um, and I think it's so important to elevate and acknowledge and give the give individuals the opportunity to identify themselves instead of being identified by society. Mm -hmm. um, and to really be able to be like, okay, this is who I am, this is who I know myself as, and to have that acknowledged, I think, is a really powerful moment, especially for individuals who have been placed with other really harmful or burdensome labels you know, to be able to be like, okay, I, you know, regardless of these labels, this is how I identify, this is how I'm comfortable bringing myself into the world. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it gives people and these conversations surrounding gender gives people the opportunity to do that. Yeah, I would agree. Tara, your thoughts? Yeah, I absolutely uh, agree with what both of them just said, but well, you know, I think the value of like communication with this, like Brooke said, we have been in the community, within the community, we've been having these conversations for forever. Um, and I think now people are more open to mm -hmm. talking about this and the, the spaces that we're talking about this are much uh, safe, like safer. And so we've been able to have more conversations about, about gender identity. And it's so important for people to be able to um, express themselves in the way that they want to be expressed you know we're talking like for their for their own mental health and for their own health and their own safety and then individuals whether you're lgbt or not or whether you're at like a like working towards advocacy um having these conversations is so important so people know that they're being respected and people know that they they have resources and safe people that they can go to um, so, but yeah, I absolutely agree with the, both of them they said. I think when we have these conversations, um, it is a form of, I, I actually sent you all a question when we talk about health equity, and this is a form of he health equity health equity when we have real conversations such as this um, because what happens is is we have we begin to learn that to all of yours point that there's more in common in terms of our conversations than there is that is dis dislike or disjointed right and that to your point these conversations have been have been having having been held for a very long time. And we also find out that actually within certain communities and conversations that people are a lot more accepting and loving than we give people credit for. I think that what happens is that we get the, the microcosm of information that's placed in the media and it just kind of throws a hailstorm of making it appear 
that those that in terms of humanity that we're not as accepting, but we really are a lot more accepting than it, it appears, but it's just, um, it, it can seem isolated at times, depending upon where you are. But for the most part, to Brooke's point, I know like when I think about the American Indian communities, um, there they have had, or within their communities, they have multiple types of genders um, in terms of conversations, especially in terms of spirituality and how that um, breaks apart. And I think a lot of people think that it's only one way, one conversation when we are talking about how that looks. So I appreciate you for bringing that up. When we go a little deeper and we have these conversations, one thing I really want to take this time to, to talk about is you said you let out with this, um, Cooper, was you said I identify as non-binary. Um, could you share with um, some, what's the difference between non-binary and there's another term um, I would be defined as, as cisgender? Yeah, so um, non-binary, at least I think Genuinely, I think that non-binary can be defined in terms of experience differently for everyone who experiences it. Mm -hmm. um, for me, at least, um, and in my experience with coming out and coming into um, really identifying as non-binary and feeling comfortable with that was that I have never felt on one side or the other on in terms of the gender spectrum. Um, it was always kind of you know, it was an, like you said, it's kind of was, was an isolating experience for me, especially as a kid, um, because, you know, I, I didn't fit in with the girls who wanted to play with, like, you know, certain things, and then I didn't fit in on this side, and I kind of found myself being in the middle a lot of times of the stereotypical things that we think about gender, um, and so for me, it's an acknowledgement of a spectrum that I live on each and every day, mm -hmm. um, and that, you know, I don't have, I don't need to be identified by one gender or the other. It's just, I am who I am. Um, and I am a person who doesn't feel like gender is assigned to me. Um, and then we, you mentioned the cisgender term. So cisgender is defined as someone who identifies as the gender that they were assigned at birth. Mm -hmm. Um, so like, so you were, can, you would be considered born female and you still go by she, her pronouns and are still identify as a female. Um, and therefore you would be a cisgendered woman, um, if that makes sense. It does. And I appreciate you taking the time to help um, those who may not understand the difference in language and um, who are um, in this space trying to, to learn and to become more aware. It's, it is, um, it does a, a major service to our community when we take the time to respect people's pronouns and respect how they want to be identified and also take the time to understand the, as language evolves, right? And so what may have been one thing in the past, you know, we have to be open and respective of trying to learn something different. Um, an example I can give you is here at Health and Human Services, one of the recent things that we have adopted is um, in, the, in the previous times, we used to say stakeholders. Uh, um, and all of you, we all know exactly exactly what that means when it comes to um, the community. Someone um, has vested value into your organization. Well, we no longer say stakeholders here. We say vested parties. And one of the reasons why we don't say stakeholders is because of the historical trauma and, associate, um, and atrocities that are attacked, um, attached to the word stakeholders um, in terms of our indigenous communities and also with our Black Americans. So as time goes, goes on, what may seem acceptable right? We have to be open and willing to change that language, especially if we know for a fact that that language um, can be offensive um, or cause triggers and trauma to others. So that's the same when we talk about cisgendered, non-binary, they, them, theirs. Um, we have to be open and receptive to, um, to change our language so we can be more inclusive in how we have conversations. Um, when we talk about um, being more inclusive, um, one of the things that has been on my mind is when we say LGBT, do we say LGBT or do we see L LGBTQIA? Like, how, how do we navigate those waters in terms of, um, of, of stating the community? I think um, I think it's going to depend on each scenario. Um, I, there's not a 
I wouldn't say there's like a, this is, you know, how you do it every single time. I think it depends on who you're talking to. So, you know, who's, who's the community that you're talking to? Who's your target audience? Um, what is the, you know, what capacity are you speaking in? So is this a casual conversation um, or is this a more formal, you know, conversation? Um, the most inclusive is going to be probably LGBTQIA+. Um, mm -hmm. is going to be the most so when you're writing things down you know if you're building policy things like that you certainly want to be most inclusive um and and i would at the moment um i would say that that's probably what is most inclusive as i mentioned before with gender things are always changing and evolving right mm -hmm. and language is always changing and evolving and so what we say today is best practices could be considered best practices today Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, we encourage folks on campus to redo our safe zone trainings, you know, every two years or so, because we are constantly updating as we develop new language that best fits our experiences. Mm -hmm. We're putting that language out there, um, but it's going to change and it's going to evolve. So I would say a lot of it depends. Um, you know, I'll speak for me personally, and then I'll let other folks share their opinions um, mm -hmm. as well. Um, you know, for me personally, as if I'm doing something more formal, I may say LGBTQA plus as we get into conversations, I may shorten it to LGBT with the idea that everybody knows I'm, you know, I'm just kind of shortening it for time or to make things, um, uh, you know, kind of flow a little bit better. You know, the other, the other piece I like to talk about is using the word queer as well. Um, that's becoming increasingly common, I would say, especially in academia, especially on college campuses, queer theory, um, queer studies, um, our students in general typically understand queer being an inclusive umbrella term. And the unique thing about queer is that it encompasses sexualities as well as gender, but also under, we also put an emphasis that those are two separate things, right? They're not the same thing. Um, and so a lot of times we, when we're talking about folks, we're talking about the queer community, right? Or our queer students, queer identified students. Um, you know, with that said, I know that a lot of folks um, still may find that word offensive, which is always important to also know your community, right? Like, who are you speaking to and, and being understanding that there may be folks in the audience that are unsure of that word or might be offended by that word. So being able to have a conversation, you know, if I'm going to be using the word queer, saying queer community, I also need to have a conversation about why I'm choosing to use that word, right? And if we're not comfortable in doing that, then maybe that's not a word that we should use. Mm -hmm. So again, um, those are just, those are my thoughts and I will let other folks share anything else. So I, I, I did wanna um, kind of jump in. I echo what Brooke just said. It kind of depends on where you are and what situation you're in and, and as well as what you're gonna be using the term for and to talk about. Mm -hmm. um, I will say too, there is a longer acronym as well that includes the two-spirit native um, individuals as well, and it's 2SLGBTQIA+. Okay. Um, so you might see that as well, and that's just an even more inclusive term, and specifically for like in any type of policy writing or anything like that, if you want to be kind of all-inclusive of um, native queer individuals as well, that, mm -hmm. that term often gets thrown in there. Um, and I, and I also want to say from like a data perspective too, um, with using that term, especially when you're seeing data, when you're seeing scholarship, um, sometimes that acronym will also be shortened mm -hmm. um, because they were unable to capture anyone from the you know, QIA plus kind of mm -hmm. segment and were only able to really capture you know, lesbian, bisexual, um, gay or transgender mm -hmm. individuals in their study and therefore they're not even gonna list the rest of the acronym because it doesn't include individuals from that identified in that way as well mm -hmm. um so you might see that within research and like it's not anything of trying to be less inclusive or more inclusive it might also just be who was responding to the research at the time mm -hmm. um and what the research was at the time. So I think that's important. And I mean, you'll even hear me kind of like Brooke said, and I'm kind of echoing this point of, at first I'll kind of say the whole LGBTQIA plus acronym and then throughout conversation, it'll kind of get shortened to LGBTQ or I'll say queer community, um, depending on my audience and what people are comfortable with um, to just kind of, you know, keep conversation flow too, because I know that that is, you know, 
in the middle of a conversation often not something that people want to just put in there so um yeah it's just about knowing who you're talking to what your community is and making sure that people understand too that if you do drop any of those letters off during conversation that you're not being less inclusive in that sentence that you're just using it for time management purposes as well so um cooper so one of the you also you brought up data how important is data um within capturing um, information in terms of the LGBTQIA plus population? Extremely important. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, there's not a lot of it. <laughs> um, there's more and more emerging, especially as we're having these conversations, um, specifically for LGBTQ involvement in the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. We're really seeing a lack of data, even though we see all of these generalized reports and nationwide reports of like, there's so many LGBTQ individuals involved in the criminal justice system who are being victimized by the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. And yet on a like more statewide, countywide basis, we don't see that data continue to be tracked. Mm -hmm. um, and so we don't know really on a local basis how many of our LGBTQ community members are being impacted by the criminal justice system or are being impacted by other systems of inequity or any other type of um issues and so it's it makes it even harder to kind of get out there and be like okay this is why we need a program for this or this is why we need funding for this because that data isn't already available um and i was going to say a data it data and having data and having documentation makes it so that more programs more resources can emerge mm -hmm. um, because we do live in a data-driven age and um, so I think it's just extremely important to kind of have these conversations about the fact that on a local level, we don't see a lot of data tracking. And it's also how comfortable people are self-identifying mm -hmm. on any type of forms that are used for data tracking. And mm -hmm. we're going to have kind of a dark figure within data of people who aren't comfortable self-identifying. Mm -hmm. And so we have to also acknowledge that within the data field, we're never fully getting the full picture um, just because of how things have historically been run yeah I think that's something that I actually was thinking about um you st you stated that um within our LGBT community that um they are two times more likely to be arrested and um and with that understanding um uh, when we are talking about those who are currently um involved with the justice system whether they are um, currently behind bars or um involved in different um programs like probation etc you know parole or something like that um it it it, it would appear to me because of the um the environment that they're in, that it would not be safe for some to feel that they could identify, right? And so how do we um, accurately track those numbers um, for those who may or may not feel safe to identify, also depending upon the population, like are, are they being placed in, you know, currently in terms of our penal system, we divide people into either male or female. So you're going to either a male, you know, prison or you're going to a female prison, right? So capturing that, if I, I probably would, if I, if I was a person that was LGBT, I probably would feel more comfortable in and I'm just being assumptive, so correct me, that I will probably feel more comfortable identifying in a female prison versus feeling more comfortable identifying in a male prison, just because of the hyper-masculinity that's associated and all the trauma and discrimination that comes with being in that in that particular population. Am I making sense in, in terms of my, my question? Absolutely, and I will say that even just your... Um... <laughs> kind of thought process around it is shown in the data because mm -hmm. we see that one in 20 men nationwide and these are all based on surveys and reports that were done several years ago we haven't had many updates um so yeah, because I COVID <laughs> yeah I was gonna say I would not say that this is the accurate count as of today by any mm -hmm. means mm -hmm. um but I will say that based on the most recent surveys and information that we do have um, one in 20 minute, one in 20 um, men nationwide in prisons, like in male prisons, identify self-identified as LGBTQ, whereas one in three women in women prisons self-identified as LGBTQ. However, this is also because LGBTQ women of color are 
disproportionately impacted at every single level of every single system, but mm -hmm. specifically in the criminal justice system. And so that that's part of the reason for that rate, but also another part of that reason for that rate is comfortability identifying and being able to self-identify. And I think too, your conversation surrounding the gendered nature of our carceral systems mm -hmm. um, is one that you see a lot in the media and um, specifically with everything that's going on in terms of like transgender individuals being within prisons and there being, you know, incidences and different things spun in the media to make this a really like dark topic, actually, mm -hmm. when you go into the field of criminal justice. Um, but I think what's important too is that as we continue having these conversations, the actual policy is to let people choose where they are placed. Um, but whether that's carried out most of the time, usually not. Um, and also, we also see transgender individuals specifically um, being placed in what is called safekeeping, which is actually just solitary confinement. Mm -hmm. um, and they're being told that it's for their own safety, but then that's you know further neglecting them <laughs> of different care and different and I mean it's traumatizing I mean any mm -hmm. type of being completely isolated like that is extremely traumatizing for any individual mm -hmm. um and so I think it's important that we acknowledge all of these different factors when we talk about this mm -hmm. um because there are so many you know issues that are still happening and that are making it so people are not comfortable identifying and are making you know and that then translates into any type of tracking for that is very difficult and I think again it's just important to remind yourself and anyone who's looking at research or data regarding this that nothing is ever going to be the complete picture because mm -hmm. it is also dependent on whether people are comfortable self-identifying mm -hmm. and, and a lot of times as much as we are opening up these conversations people still are not especially within the criminal justice or the carceral system so mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I definitely would agree with it with you on that Carl when we are talking about our families um what type of peers um uh what type of support family support do we connect our families to when it comes to um LGBT um LGBT issues um within New Hanover County so we're really fortunate in um locally in Wilmington to have the LGBT Resource Center, mm -hmm. um, you know, and I think I still, I should have looked before <laughs> we got on, but they have, a, they have a list of knowledgeable and competent um, providers for LGBT youth and families. Um, I hope that's still on their website. I mean, I'm sure it was like a month ago when I looked, so, mm -hmm. um, but we refer to them. I refer to the Trevor Project a lot, mm -hmm. which is a, um, a, like suicide hotline for LGBT youth. And I refer to, I, I refer to that a lot because these kids need to know that there's a third party that they can reach out to for support and they can do texts. They do, they have a chat on their, mm -hmm. um, on their website. They do phone calls. Um, so we refer to that a lot. And then there's um, PFLAG, which is for parents of mm -hmm. uh, LGBT uh, kids that they have resources and we do have a Cape Fear. Um, there is one in the Cape Fear region. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we're constantly like referring or, you know, there's local um, like LGBT advocates um, referring to those having like, you know, talking to professionals about having, hey, have you had a safe zone training? Like, do you do you want to get a safe zone training? Because I know Brooke. And so, you know, um, not only just referring for our families and our kids that we're working with, but also talking with your colleagues and professionals about what resources and trainings we can get them as well. Mm -hmm. um, and sitting in that space, either Car or Brooke, you, go, you all can expand on this. What is safe zone training for those who don't know? Brooke, I feel like I haven't done, I haven't facilitated a safe zone training in a year now. So I feel like you're <laughs> so much more qualified to answer that. Yeah, I got you. I got you. Um, so safe zone training, um, I mean, it, it originated uh, really in schools, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, on college campuses in the early 2000s, typically was when we started to see um, these workshops coming out of um, different places on campus, you know, at that time, there weren't very many, if any, maybe a handful of actual LGBTQA centers. 
Um, so they're kind of coming out of, you know, other faculty were running them, but essentially what it is, is it's a workshop series. Um, now it's developed into a workshop series. Um, and I would best describe it as an LGBTQA 101. Um, mm -hmm. And so we talk through a lot of language, what language to use, why we use that language. We dive into um, different definitions. We, you know, we'll extensively talk through sexual orientation. We'll talk through gender identity. Mm -hmm. um, we'll talk about the differences and that those two are not the same thing and that we yeah. all have those things, right? Mm -hmm. Like we all have sexual orientation and we all have a gender identity. It's not unique within the queer community. Mm -hmm. um, it's just that folks within the queer community tend to think about these things more often because um, we may not fit the norms quite as quite as much. And so those things tend to be on our minds a little bit more because we're um, folks within the queer community are trying to figure out like where we fit, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so we talk through, um, you know, kind of some of those definitions. We do experiential exercises. Um, and we also talk about resources and, and how to be an ally. And so um, typically they've started out, Safe Zone again, you know, 20 years ago, started out as like this one big, you know, workshop of three hours usually of mm -hmm. like all of this information. Um, most places now or, or other folks like, like we have, we've gone to kind of a more workshop series mm -hmm. where we, um, talk, uh, you know, we have it broken into four different pieces. They're each about two hours long. Um, and again, the first one is our LGBT 101. So it's very basic. Um, and you know, we kind of do surface level. The second one is all gender. So it's all about gender. We do a two hour workshop, um, around gender, gender identity, um, and again, we always put in pieces of, of how to be an ally, but our last workshop series is, is what we call active ally, mm -hmm. which is all scenarios about, you know, a lot of times people want us to give them like a checkbox of like, here are the things you need to check off to be an ally. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, we need to add our pronouns here and we need to do this. Um, and those are all great things. Um, but what we really encourage is that we need folks to be active. And so we're going to give you the information and the tools. And then we want you to take that information back to your area of expertise and implement it there. I don't know what your job is, right? And I can't tell you what your forms look like and how you're practicing, right? Like that's your area of expertise. What I can do is give you pieces and information so that you can take it back and that you can make your your space and what you have control over as inclusive as it can be, right? Mm -hmm. And I can give you the tools to be able to do that, but I rely on you to take an active role in supporting the LGBTQA community, which is why we call it Active Ally. You know, I love that because that goes right in line to something that I say all the time. I say equity is not a conversation. Equity is action, you know. And so when we have these conversations, we have to move from um, being in spaces just to check boxes. We have to, what are you intentionally doing um, within your organization that is creating an inclusive environment? Um, diversity is important. And we we realize that, and I think that we're doing good in turn or doing better. Better. Let me rephrase that. <laughs> We're doing better in terms of creating diverse environments. But in that diverse envir environment, the other part is inclusive inclusiveness. You know, what are we doing to be inclusive, actionable steps that we are really doing? And these are sustainable, actionable steps that we should be doing, not just, oh, because it's June and it's Pride Month. So this month we're going to put our flag on the window. This month we're going to put the stick sticker outside. And, you know, we're going to offer, you know, every person that identifies as LGBT can come get a free cupcake. <laughs> you know, so, you know, but what are we, what are these actionable things that are sustainable that you're doing 365 days a year, every single year that allows all people to know that this is my stance. This is what we're doing to allow everyone to feel inclusive or included um, or seen. I like to say people go where they're welcome, but they stay where they're valued. And so if you want to have that customer to feel valued and continuously to come back to your organization or patronize you or to receive services, then you need to do things that are sustainable and not just because it's that month, if that makes sense. Um, and so with that being said, you know, what what could we be doing better within New Hanover County um, and it, collectively and independently? What do you think that we could need to be doing better when we have these conversations? Um, 
I think, you know, we, we just need to be mindful that we need to keep having these conversations. Mm -hmm. Like this needs to be something that we talk about consistently. Like we need to brought up earlier how these conversations are always evolving and the language is constantly changing. Um, And so we need to be having consistent conversations about how we're working with our LGBT families. Um, Because then if not, we're just going to miss something. Um, So I think having those conversations and consistently having trainings and consistently, you know, like learning this new information and then also being open to asking questions. Um, I think that's something that we need to continue to do. And, you know, no social worker should ever be shocked that we have a resource because we need to always be talking about this. Um, So that's something that I think we need to, I think we do a good job of it, but I think we also need to keep improving on it as well. Mm -hmm. Cooper? I think creating more safe community spaces just overall and having more spaces that we can have these conversations within would be really impactful. Um, And then also, I think I'm going to echo Kara and say, like, I mean, having these trainings, having these consistent trainings, having these consistent conversations is really what's going to drive at creating a more inclusive space, because the more you have these conversations, the more questions are asked, the more, you know, conversations can be had and the more understanding can be created. Um, And I think, too, like, I mean, I really loved hearing Brooke talk about the active allyship piece of everything is mm-hmm. making sure that individuals who do want to support the community are engaging in that active allyship and if they're not they're asking how they can mm-hmm. um and making and i mean like I, i'll give an example of like i mean frankie roberts who's the wonderful executive director at link he leads by an example at link of you know every anytime i walk into a room he makes sure he acknowledges my pronouns if there is any moment where you know um pronouns are not feeling acknowledged or something is said he is the first to be like nope and correct himself and I think too having these conversations of like correcting ourselves in Mm -hmm. terms of this and learning from you know traditional things that we're used to saying or used to putting out there um is really impactful as well and Mm -hmm. allowing people to have that space to you know sometimes these conversations are not going to be easy sometimes these changes are not going to be easy however it's about giving grace to everyone Mm -hmm. I think I think that's a big piece of it I I would agree with you I think it's about I think the the ground zero is that when we we should be having these conversations but we had we need to be in a space of having these conversations and leaving your emotions out of it um and coming in with a clear mind and coming in with I'm just com- I'm coming to learn I'm coming to be accepted I'm coming to have compassion and when we have conversations to see to listen to learn to say okay I'm taking this information back and now and not only am I incorporating it at my organization or my corporation but I'm also incorporating it into my personal values and how I see and do things because the more you incorporate it in your personal personal values, it becomes habit. So you know when you are having conversation with your friends, your families, those things that are not a part of your work, you are automatically on alert in how you say certain things, how you move, how you look at people, how you have conversations. You no longer snicker. And when you see two women or two men that come into a room or, you know, have those side conversations that might can can instill implicit bias and, you know, and allow to continue to perpetuate, right? So if you start um, incorporating these in your own personal values, it allows you to start respecting people for who they are and not how they identify. And one of the things that you mentioned that you all were overdoing um, is you, you spoke about a certification that you're doing at um, at Link. Could you expand on that a little bit more? Yeah, so um, the where we offer a Link Ally certificate and it's um, given to people who have engaged. So I was given the opportunity to lead an affirmative practice tra- practices training for Link staff. Um, earlier last year and since then we've started up a link ally program um so 
if the staff member engages in a conversation um, surrounding the affirmative practices training and then completes the self-led online safe zone training mm -hmm. um, and can show me a certificate of completion of that. Um, and then we have a conversation surrounding, you know, what did you learn from that? And then they are able and like, what does it mean to be an ally to make sure that that active allyship understanding is there? And then they can get a certification to hang in their office that certifies them as a link ally to, you know, kind of indicate that, you know, at link this this office is a safe space. Um, this this individual has knowledge on serving the LGBTQ community, um, that kind of thing. And I think that's been really impactful. Um, and I actually didn't know that we could send individuals to UNCW for that as well. So you might see some link staff coming over your way, Brooke, pretty <laughs> soon. Um, Cause I will be, cause there have been a couple that have been like, I don't wanna do this online. Um, so I will be sending some link staff your way as well um, to get that certification and to put that in our office and to really just, you know, make it so when people walk into link, they see those ally certificates and they're like, okay, this is a safe space for me. Mm -hmm. And I can self-identify in this space, even if I wasn't able to in the space that I was in last, which for a lot of our clients is within incarceration. Uh, is that also available now? Can the common public or the general public participate in that? So right now it is just within link stuff, but I would be more than open <laughs> So having conversations about opening it up to the general public. Um, mm. And I will say too, I think an important thing to note with allyship is that you have to be acknowledged as an ally by someone within the community to fully, like you can't self-identify. It's like, mm. oh, I'm an ally, you know? Um, and so I think that's an important piece with that. Um, but yeah, I would be more than happy um, to share it with the broader community as well. I would love that actually. We actually have a question for you. Um, uh Let's see, Cooper. The question is, what what currently um, is the biggest barrier to reentry in the city and separately in the county? Do you have an answer for that? Transportation and housing. <laughs> okay, those are the two, and they're going to continue to be the two. Um, I mean, even I, I mean, I'll I'll say even outside of the work I do with Link, I have a friend who, um, and I asked if they were comfortable with me sharing this, but who they received a small misdemeanor and they've even had trouble finding housing. Mm -hmm. um, and so you can only, you know, imagine how much harder that is for individuals with, you know, longer histories of incarceration or any type of history being incarcerated for any period of time. Um, you know, it's, it's again, you know, that label is placed on you. And unfortunately, there are still a lot of applications and a lot of opportunities that are not given <laughs> to individuals with any type of criminal histories. Um, and we're continuing to fight for, you know, ban the box on not only employment applications, but also on housing applications and acknowledging that that's important. Um, and it does continue to be our biggest challenge is finding housing for people and making sure people have accurate or not accurate, um, appropriate transportation here and there. So, um, in general, as far as New Hatteras Canton, New Hatteras County is concerned, um, and anyone can answer this. Um, um, what is the or what space would you all say that you see the most discrimination in when, when we talk about our LGBT um, community? Um, I would, I don't know, I wouldn't, I'm not sure about discrimination in general. What I would say is there's a lot of microaggression, or mm -hmm. microaggression, um, a, kind of across the board, right? You know, kind of, um, anytime people are kind of out and about, um, just kind of those, the microaggression of, um, you know, bathrooms, checking, you know, asking people if they're in the right bathrooms or, you know, folks are, you know, holding hands or with a group or something and they're kind of going around downtown doing different things, um, getting, you know, yelled at or cat called or those types of, of things happen fairly frequently. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I want to kind of go back to a little bit of what we were talking about with allyship. Mm -hmm. um, because I think that obviously I think I think workshops are great, right? Like, let's go to all the workshops. Um, that's one tool, right? Like, that's one thing that we can do that's available to all of us to make sure that we're, you know, being an active ally, a true ally. Um, 
And I would also encourage folks or think about like, what, what are you reading right now? Are you, are you reading inclusive materials? What does your media consumption look like? Are you watching shows with queer characters that are portrayed in a positive light? Are you reading books about um, queer characters? Or what does your friend circle look like? What does your social circle look like? So these workshops are a really great tool, but we also have a lot of other ways that we can, you know, learn and interact with the LGBTQA community that don't necessarily include workshops, right? Like those workshops are not always accessible to everybody. Um, and so just because you can't attend a workshop doesn't mean like, well, I tried. So like, uh, you know, like I'm pretty good, right? Like there are so many different documentaries out there that folks can watch. There are so many different ways that people can get involved and can be an ally. Um, and for people to say like, well, it doesn't affect me. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say, or like, well, I don't really care what people do. I just, you know, it's like, I'm not political, but these types of comments, that's a really privileged place to be sitting, right? Mm -hmm. Like a lot of us don't have the ability to be able to do that. So if that's where folks headspace are, I would just kind of encourage think, folks to kind of think through that. Like, well, what does that look like? How is it that we're able to say like, well, I'm not, I don't want to get involved in this. It's too political. It's too heated, um, you know? That's a, that's if that's where you are, that's that's fine. I would just like to also let people know that a lot of us don't have the ability to be able to step out of that conversation. I love that you said that because I equate that same type of phrase to to when people say, I don't see color. And and um and and it, so it it kind of makes everything like this whole you know vanilla kind of thing you know I I respect everybody I, I you know I don't see color you know I treat everybody the same and and you know me and my boldness like I want you to see me I want to see all my black girl <laughs> all that I bring to the table my you know my my um my phrase out phrasing and how I say certain things how I might do my hair just you know every Everything that makes who I am. And when you use that type of phrasing um, to say, well, you know, it's, it's, it's too political for me, you know, it's, you know, let them do what they want to do. And, you know, because it doesn't affect us, you know, type of thing. Um, I think that this, it definitely is coming from a, a space of privilege um, because when we really dial that back and we really look at things, we're all interconnected, the ecosystem of life, of how anything happens. And even if you wanted to take it down to the most minute way, and what I mean by that is um, if something were to happen to Kara and even if you don't personally know her, if something were to happen to her, it's still a void in the in in what happens. She's got friends, she's got family, she has a community of people that would be upset if something were to happen to her. Then when we break it down to the employment issue, now we've got to replace her job. It 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 happens in so many different ways. And so when you tap out of that conversation in that way, it really takes you to a space of like, are you really respecting people for? Or the humanity that they bring um, and seeing them for the, the vast amount of um, peacockness, so to speak, that I like to say, um, into um, into into the um, the community that they're in, and we all have something different. You know, nobody likes to eat a bowl of lettuce. You know, so you know, I like to enjoy the the tomatoes, the cucumbers, the red peppers, and everything in it because it all makes a, a great salad. But if all I eat just a, is lettuce, you know, how bland is that? <laughs> so, um, so I appreciate that you said that. Um, we have another question because it's eleven o'clock, and I want to make sure that we're mindful of time. Um, one of the questions that um, was asked to you, Brooke, is, Brooke, where can I read about Indigenous people's categories for LGBTQIA? Um, he said that I'm reading a new biography about Lydia Maria Child. Um, she was born in 1800 and seeing her writing to Margaret Fuller about cooperating on research. Sure. Um, so I don't have any, I don't have any specific titles in front of me, um, specifically around indigenous cultures. But what I'll say, um, I think there was a documentary put out maybe like two years ago that has has gone through several different indigenous communities throughout the world, right? So it's we're not just talking about the Americas. It's this is indigenous communities across the world that kind of dive into gender across the board with indigenous communities. 
Um, so there's a lot of information out there um, that's uh, I would say fairly accessible. Um, so I would, if, if you're looking, you know, I don't know exactly, you know, obviously there are also a lot of different indigenous communities. So depending on what indigenous community you're looking for in general, um, you know, there's tons of information out there across the board, you know, from the Americas to, um, there was, I, I want to say there was something else I was, I was reading or watching, um, about New Zealand as well. And some of the indigenous mm -hmm. communities there. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of information out there to be consumed. Absolutely. Um, and so I'm going to leave with these two. So the last question is, um, what steps can an organization or a company, um, take to support gender equity? Um, so we'll start with Cara. <clears throat> I think, you know, there's a ton of layers to that, you know, it starts with, you know, cause it's not only about like, put a rainbow sticker on a door and everybody's happy. And, you know, it also goes to, yeah, the rainbow stickers on the door. Our staff is trained and our staff is actively practicing, you know, um, being knowledgeable and, you know, respectful. And then also what do your forms look like? Like, what are, are your forms done, like accepted and you're, mm -hmm. you know, um, so there's tons of layers. It's having an inclusive environment, but also making sure your staff's good, making sure your forms are up to date, making sure your flyers are up to date, mm -hmm. making sure people know that your staff, like you're, you guys are good. So I think those are like the first step is the first step is just straight up starting mm -hmm. and, you know, realizing that you have to be inclusive, like you should be inclusive mm -hmm. and starting the process. But yeah, there's a ton of different stuff from the environment to um, like I said, staff training and just what you do in general. Mm -hmm. Cooper, thank you, Cara. I, yeah, I would agree with Cara. I think, I mean, obviously making sure your all of your forms are up to date, that like on any applications or any kind of any forms that you have to have your staff or clients fill out, that mm -hmm. there's the box for sex and a box for gender identity, you know, mm -hmm. that you're kind of including both of those and acknowledging that at all levels of the organization is extremely mm -hmm. important. Um, making sure that, you know, if, you know, again, like Cara said, if you are, you know, putting that ally certificate in your link office or whatever it is that you're putting up to indicate, hey, you know, we, we are inclusive of this, that you're actually continuing to engage in that active allyship and that you are continuing to be actively inclusive and that you're continuing to educate and re-educate yourself as things change and as things continue to progress. Um, and then I also think it's important at any organization or any company for leadership to really lead by example um, and to for leadership to really be taking the head on you know, we are inclusive of this, we are, we are going to acknowledge this in our organization. And, you know, then it also leads staff to understand like this is a priority set forth by leadership as well. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. Brooke? Yeah, sure. And I'll, again, echo uh, Karen Cooper here. Uh, forms, I feel like are like the low hanging fruit, right? <laughs> like mm -hmm. you go through your forms, you can change that in a second. Same thing, um, you know, language in general, you can change that in a second. It's super low hanging fruit. What I'm going to say to that though, is don't change a form just to change a form and then misgender somebody through the entire interaction, right? So yes. we're not, we're not going to change a form just to say we're changing forms and then not pay attention, not correct ourselves, not think about things. Right. So when we're doing that, we need action behind it. Right. And that might mean slowing down conversations that might mean thinking through things a little bit. Right. So we're not just changing it to change it, but we're changing it because it's something that we actually believe in, mm -hmm. um, because that's a that's a difference, right? Like we can go through and change things for a checkbox and be like, look, we're inclusive. No, you're not. And I can tell you that as soon as I send students over there and they're misgendered the entire time they're there, I'm going to hear about it. And mm -hmm. then we're not sending students there anymore. Right. Yeah. Um, or they're going to tell their friends that that stuff travels really really quickly yes, so when we're doing these things we're we also need to be mindful about it and we need to do what we say that we're actually doing mm -hmm. um and i know i know we're running up on time and i know there's several uh questions around what is currently taking place like currently as in right this second taking place with the supreme court um so what i do want to say to that is we obviously don't know how things are going to play out 
um, mm -hmm. in the next little while. We have no idea how things are going to play out. Um, but what we do know is that these conversations and our allies are more important now than ever. That's because right. we need people fighting in our corner with us um, as these things start rolling out. So, um, you know, I don't know what's going to happen that uh, I'm not not a law, a law expert. Um, so I can't I can't tell you that. But what I can tell you is that we have quite a fight coming up ahead of us. And uh, we need folks in our corner who truly believe in in equity and in support. And so I would want to throw that out there, too. I would have to agree with you 100%, you know, with the ruling um, yesterday in terms of um, dialing back affirmative, affirmative action. I mean, we really, you know, I'm not a law professor, um, as you stated, but as a, a person and an individual, we just got to pay attention, you know, and we got to strengthen our allies. We have to um, be thoughtful about what we do. We have to be strategic in how we move um, because all of these things that are happening impact all of us. Um, one question um, that Eden asked and, and something I didn't get to, which is very important, was can, can anyone quickly speak to the potential barriers and access availability for health care, specifically in terms of mental and primary care for our LGBT um, identified individuals? Individuals, not individuals. <laughs> Um, do y'all want me to start or do one of you want to start? Uh, go ahead, bro. <laughs> okay. Um, what I will say is that there is definitely a lack of a, affirming services. Um, here, it can be very tricky for folks to find practitioners that can assist with things like hormones. Um, it's obviously getting increasingly difficult for gender affirming care in general um, in North Carolina, as well as in other places in the United States. Um, but there's also a lack of um, knowledgeable practitioners around uh, ge that gender affirming care as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so I would say in general, um, it's, it's tricky. Same thing with mental health support as well. Um, there are a lot of mental health providers that might, again, say the right things on a form um, and then have somebody come in and realize that that person may not be as affirming as what they originally thought. So I would say from what I'm hearing from students, from colleagues, from peers, is that it is challenging to find both primary care physicians that are affirming, um, as well as mental health providers that are affirming. And again, for folks who aren't as connected with the queer community, when people find somebody that is affirming, that stuff goes quick. Um, so as people are asking for resources, those names, I see the same names popping up over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for that. Um, I did um, want to give um, two um, supportive comments. One is we just had an anonymous attendee and he says, um, um, I'm a gay male, and this was a great learning session. Um, and so he he he's not active in the LGBT, LGBTQ plus community, but he did want to say that this was a great learning session. And then also um, the Alan Perez says, good morning. I just wanted to begin my thank you by thanking you all for the great and important work you do. This is such a sensitive topic, and I'm very grateful to have some intelligent, passionate people who are out there doing amazing work in advocacy for these causes locally and nationally. And I want to leave um, this um, conversation um, with allowing Cooper the opportunity to tell us about Eyes into the Wall, and then we would be done. So it's eyes on the law. Sorry. I don't, no problem. <laughs> yeah, um, Thank you for correcting me. Yeah. We're a um, currently we're a public or data data driven publication group. Um, and so we do a lot of research on um, right now we're actually covering um, a series on, you know, child trauma and interactions with the justice system. Um, but we do highlight posts um, as well throughout working on um, the big publications, and then we're also in the works of creating a potential podcast, as well as um, an advocacy day, um, so kind of getting together and letting people know how we can be active advocates, um, especially in this time when there are so many um, policies and bills being passed that seem to target um, our minority communities. Um, and 
we actually put out a post today or yesterday or this week um it was on wednesday sorry um been a busy week but uh on wednesday highlighting the bills that are currently circulating around um north carolina for the lgbtq community as well as some information on what you can do to reach out to legislators um to be an advocate to be an ally um and yeah so we're just we're uh we've got two publications put out already um one is on the experience of incarcerated pregnant women and one is on um youth involvement in the criminal justice system and mm -hmm. how sentencing factors impacts different youth differently mm -hmm. um and we do have an inclusive um section of that report that focuses specifically on lgbtq youth as well i appreciate it cara any final words I just appreciate the opportunity and I hope that everybody took something from this and it's been cool to be able to talk with you guys about it. Thank you, Brooke. Any final words? Um, no, I would I would echo everyone else. I appreciate everybody's time. And um, certainly if uh, folks have questions or additional follow-up that they could, um, I know they can reach out to me. I assume that Cooper and Kara probably feel the same way. Feel free to reach out. Mm -hmm. And Cooper, final words. Just thank you so much for this opportunity um, and for inviting me to be one of the speakers. And I've enjoyed speaking with Brooke and Karen, and meeting you both. And I look forward to future connections as well. So yeah, I appreciate all of you all for um, agreeing to participate in this panel. Um, please know this isn't the last time that we will be speaking um, specifically in terms of this topic. Um, it is something that um, I find it's important. Um, I believe in the work that I do, that it's important for us to bring awareness and education um, and an action with all that we do um, and not just in one space. So I appreciate you all very much. If you need me, I'm available to, to work with you and to, um, to lift up um, whatever cause that you all need at, um, at any given time. So thank you so much. We look forward to continue our partnership with together. Um, thank you, New Haver County, for listening and being a part of this month's Equity Matters. Um, stay tuned for next month. It is BIPOC Awareness, Mental Health Awareness Month, and we have some amazing speakers that will be connecting with us um, in July. And then August is Community-Centered um, Equity Matters, and we have some amazing panelists that will be with us in in um, July and August. So keep your eyes out for that. Have a wonderful Friday. Have a wonderful 4th of July if you celebrate and um, be safe. And we'll talk soon. Bye. Let's see.